Thank you, thank you for that. Um, good morning, everyone. Good to be here. My name is Olayinka, as they said, um, developer relations engineer. What I do predominantly is I take relatively complex concepts and I try to simplify them. And I try to do that as fun as possible, right? So today we're talking about zero knowledge proofs. Zero knowledge proofs are it's a cryptographic concept. Um, it's used predominantly in cryptography, but we have, today we're talking about it as it pertains to blockchain, right? Um, and it's just, it's fun. I think it's pretty, I think it's really cool. Um, second to account abstraction is one of the other topics that I find to be really interesting, but we'll talk about zero knowledge for today. I hope that by the time we're done, you know, you know a bit more about zero knowledge proof than you came in here. Um, and just, you know, to carry out a survey, does anyone, have you heard of zero knowledge proofs before? If you have, can I see your hands up just so I know what we're working with? Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Okay, cool. So, I mean, relatively good company. So, um, it's an introductory primer, so I'm hoping, um, the goal is to do a really good job to simplify the concept. So, what are ZKPs? So, ZKPs are the, is going to be the abbreviation for zero knowledge proofs. Um, a ZKP or a zero knowledge proof is a cryptographic proof that allows one party to prove it possesses certain information without revealing that information. I don't like this description, but I put it in here just because I'm going to, I don't like, I think it's too much. The one I like, however, is this one. It is the ability to prove honest computation without revealing inputs. Now, what exactly does that look like? So what, we're what, I'm, what you do when you're trying to work with zero knowledge proof is this. Person A and person B. So person A has a piece of information, but they need to prove to person B that they know that information without telling them anything about the information, right? So now you might say, well, why would you want to do that? Why don't you just tell me what you know and we can move on, right? And we'll get to that. We'll get to why it is important in a bit. But it is just the ability to prove to an individual, um, a computer system, the blockchain, whatever, that you have a piece of information without saying anything more than, um, or without proving anything else than the fact that you do know what you're talking about. So what does that look like? There is a really cool example I'll be showing you. And this is, again, I'm choosing this example because it's popular, it's used, the example is cool. So the example is the where is Waldo zero knowledge proof example, right? So there is a character called Waldo. Waldo is an individual here, right? Now, if you were to prove to me via zero knowledge that you know where Waldo is without telling me where Waldo is, that is where zero knowledge proof comes in. So let's say I need to prove to you that Waldo exists here, but I don't want to give away where Waldo is because I'm giving you too much data. I'm giving you too much information. I just need to tell you, look, I know where this guy is and we can move on to the next step. So what do I do in this case? Um, and there are multiple ways to solve the problem, but in this particular example, what I'll do is, so picture this as a, let's say one by one image that's just really small, right? And then I take a huge piece of paper, say a transparent piece of paper, and I put it on top of that image. So this image, this um, yellow piece of paper is now layered on top of it. As you can see, this is smaller than this, right? The second thing I'm doing that you are also aware of is I have moved the location of this image while it was underneath this, right? Why am I doing that? I'm doing that because otherwise, if I were to directly draw out Waldo, you would know where he is. So I need to move things around so that even when I show you Waldo, you can't tell where he is because the original image you have has moved. Right, so you don't know where Waldo is, you just know that he exists. So what that looks like is I have um, an A4 paper, for example, layered on top of the original image, and I draw out a hole, a circle, right? So that circle is supposed to help us find Waldo. So what I do next is, 
like I said, I'm going to move the um, image underneath and then I'm going to cut out Wilder, right? Now, I'll go back to step and show you something. Now, Wilder is, well, this is pixelated, but Wilder is some guy wearing like striped shirt, um, white and red, and he has a hat. Now, if you were to go off of this and I take you back to the original image, you would think Wilder is like dead center. But if you look closely, you can't find that particular character dead center, right? So again, because I have moved the original image around, you can't really tell where Wilder is. But for the sake of um, this session, this is what it would look like, right? So the original image that you saw, you know, it was much further to your right and it was larger, but I had moved it around. I cut out Wilder. And as you can see here, Wilder is like you know, towards the um, top left from where I stand. And if we go back there, right now, you can probably see where Wilder is there. So what I have done is I have proven to you, at least here, that I know that um, Wilder exists in this image without, sh without showing you exactly where he is, right? And then we can validate whatever transaction we need to make. So why is this important? Why is zero knowledge proof important? Why do I need to go over the stress of moving a piece of paper underneath to prove to you that this character called Wilder exists without telling you that he exists, right? So one of the major um, problems it solves it solves is um, identity management, privacy, if you will. What does that look like? So again, a lot of the ex examples I'm going to be using are examples that is consistent with um, the terminologies if you're trying to learn zero knowledge proof from anyone or anywhere, I'd like to think. So say you walk into a bar and you are 19 or lesser than 19 or the cap to get drinks is 18 year old for 18 year olds. And you walk into the bar and you're like, okay, I need to buy a drink. And the person there, the bartender is like, okay, I need to see some ID before I sell you drinks because, of course, they need to know if you are um, above the age of drinking. And you don't want to tell them, well, I was born 1st of April 2001. Some of that is true, some of it isn't. Anyway, you don't want to tell them that, but like, you need to prove to them that you meet the criteria or you do not. So instead of um, giving them your ID that shows all of your information, let's say you have a the particular ID you're holding with you at a point in time has pretty much everything, sensitive data, all those stuff that you do not want to expose to the public. Zero knowledge proof comes in in the sense that, um, assuming the technology is advanced enough, right? So you're just going to work with me here. The card you hold already knows that you are above 18. The bartender has a machine that validates that you are above 18. So, so you, your card is the prover. The bartender's machine is the verifier, right? So you're going to take that card and perhaps place it on the machine. And the machine um, verifies or validates your claim. Do you understand? So if you were below 18, you know, you're just going to beep red and say, you know, throw this guy out or this girl out, they can't buy drinks. But if it beeps green, you can proceed to do whatever you want to do. What has happened is you've done, you've, you've, um, you've proven that you're above 18 without revealing unnecessary information, things that should be private to you, to you alone, and so on and so forth. And that is why it is super important and super cool that, you know, zero knowledge proofs are important because uh, one of the, you know, it, it's, um, it's semi-ironic and paradoxical, if you will, because one of the things people found to be really interesting about the blockchain was its transparency is was and is its transparency because you could see everything that's happening right people could go back and see the very first bitcoin that was mined and they can see who holds it they can see the transaction that has happened and all of that is great however there comes to a point where you need to execute certain transactions without revealing every single detail to the public without having every single detail available to the public and that is where zero knowledge proof comes in and since we're on the topic of like blockchain, um, the second advantage or usefulness or use case is scaling the blockchain. So with zero knowledge proof, we can scale Ethereum by building what we now know as ZK EVMs, zero knowledge Ethereum virtual machines and Z ZK rollups. Um, these are the two I'll be focusing and talking about today. And I'll be focusing on ZK rollups. So for ZK EVM, uh, the um, summary of it is a layer one solution 
that has ZK built on top of it. Vitalik, um, the, one of the co-founders of Ethereum, has perhaps the best resource you can ever read. Uh, you know, I can't do a good job on that. But it has um, a really, really, really good piece of um, article that you can take a look. And he breaks down the different types of ZK EVMs, right? Um, again, it's a, it's, it can get really long, and so I don't want to go into that right now. But we can think of, I, is anyone here familiar with Ethereum? We know what Ethereum is, like Ethereum, the virtual machine, the blockchain. So Ethereum exists, right, as an EVM, as a virtual machine. ZK EVMs are EVMs that are built to solve some of the problems Ethereum faces. One of it is like the amount of transactions you can execute per second. So when you build like a ZK EVM, it sort of is very, very, very well. Okay, now there is there are different types of them. Some are really similar to Ethereum. Some are not as similar to Ethereum, right? The ones that are really similar to Ethereum, what that looks like is if you write Solidity smart contracts, you can put every single like your code, everything that functions on like the Ethereum blockchain or the Polygon EVM, you can take that into an existing zk EVM that functions without changing anything, right? So. What that, what that would look like is, if you have an iPhone, you're moving from the iPhone 10 to the iPhone 15 Pro Max, seamless. All of your data moves seamlessly. But when you move further down this, this, um, this chart, you can see that towards the number four, you can't read it, sorry. The, the higher the number, the less similar it is to Ethereum. So at number four, we're talking about Android to iOS, right? So Android to iPhone, so that you have an Android phone and you want to move to an iPhone. You won't get, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, things might have changed. Well, I don't think it's the case that you get all 100% of your data from the Android to the iPhone. So that is what happens with like, you know, type 4 ZK EVMs. And again, I'm using these examples loosely so that we, um, I'm able to drive the point home. So what that would look like is you are making so many modifications. I remember a friend of mine told me they needed to move from Android to iOS and they had to pay for a piece of software to help them like, um, carry out, move, carry over some applications, right? So, right, it's, as opposed to iPhone to iPhone, seamless in a snap, we have you having to pay for different software, you have you having to rewrite your code. In this case, often, more often than not, we have you needing to use different toolings to compile your code and then run them on the EVM. And so, again, I was supposed to give a summary on ZK EVM, but I, I you know, I got sidetracked. But yeah, if you want to learn a lot more about ZK EVMs, you can. I encourage you to read this article. Um, hopefully you can see the link, or you can just like Google types, ZK EVM types, Vitalik, and you'll find it. All right, this one is fun. So ZK rollups, how do ZK rollups scale Ethereum, right? So like I said, ZK rollups, they verify, um, well, not ZK rollups, ZK, zero knowledge proofs. There are provers and verifiers of verifying transactions that exist on the blockchain. So what that looks like is, so say a ZK rollup exists and we're executing transaction on that chain. So we can give, uh, let's just find a generic name. I'll use scroll for the sake of, okay, no, I don't want to use scroll. Um, I'll use paper, yes. All right, so there is a ZK rollup called paper and then there is the Ethereum virtual machine. So what's happening is we're executing all of our transactions on paper, right? So we're able to run a thousand transactions per second. We're able to run 2,000 transactions per second. So then we take all of that transaction that has been executed, right? We batch those together. Every single rectangle that you see, or square rather, that you see is a transaction. So there are like, what, 10 of them. So there are like 10 um, squares inside of that bigger cube, and it is batched in that cylinder. And then every single one of them is a transaction that has been executed. The point is, the ZK rollup can execute a lot more transactions per second than Ethereum can. So once it does that, it sends the proof of the fact that these transactions happened to the Ethereum virtual machine. So the Ethereum virtual machine verifies that, okay, look, I don't need to handle the computation of these transactions. I don't need to um, mine the block. I don't need to do any of that. All I need to do is, did they happen? Yes when he, the um, Ethereum virtual machine verifies that, adds that to the block, right? Going back there, a, a ton of transactions. So um, there are, let's say there are about 50, 50 or maybe 70 of us in here. There are two people. One is a 70, maybe an 80-year-old man, and another one is a young man like myself, right? 
Um, by virtue of biology, I am relatively quicker at you know, running computations than the 80 year old man, right? So everyone comes to me, they tell me their problems or they tell me whatever they need to tell me. The 75 year old man doesn't need to know the details. He trusts me enough because of cryptography, if you will. But he trusts me enough by, let's say, we, we know ourselves, maybe it's my dad, I just can't lie to him. But he trusts whatever I say enough that he just needs to hear that person A was present at this event. Then he verifies that and he adds that to the block, right? Again, if we go back to see why this is important, if every single one of us were to come to that 75 year old man, we'll be here for a very long time, right? So think of a ZK roll up as an able bodied young individual that is solving the computation. Computations are transactions. Uh, when you're creating a smart contract, you are sending tokens, you are minting an NFT. All of those transactions happening on the blockchain are done on the ZK rollup, right? And then the proof that those transactions happen are then sent to the Ethereum virtual machine or the Polygon virtual machine. They verify that transaction, they add that transaction to the block, and a new block is generated and repeats the cycle, repeats the process, and we can see that we're able to execute much, much faster transactions than Ethereum is able to. Now, to further drive this point home, if we've interacted with um, cryptocurrencies in a relatively intense bull market, you know that if you're trying to purchase a token or swap a token even, I mean, like some people told me they're trying to swap maybe like $10 worth of whatever token it is, and they're having to pay like $100 worth of gas fees. Now, gas fees are like transport fare, right? Imagine you need to move from here to here, like literally, you need to move from here to here, and they're telling you, no, you can't do that until you pay like 5000 there. Right. Reason being, there's just a lot of traffic. I'm not even kidding. Like the traffic between here to here is insane that to front run that and to get that as quickly as possible, you need to pay a higher fare for the traffic warden to like, you know, allow you move faster. When we have a ZK EVM, right? So the traffic is here. You then we create a new lane that is much faster. To verify that that transaction is happening, the lane executes all of you, you know, all of you, you're good, you're cleared, you can move on. And then the proof that that transaction happens is sent to the other lane, the main lane, the main chain, if you will. That is verified and that is added to the block. Point in case is ZK rollups help to scale Ethereum in ways that currently um, cannot function because of the design and the blockchain trial and that we're currently experiencing. So to recap, what we just went over. Zero knowledge proofs are the ability to prove honest computation without revealing imputes. I think one of the key words is honest computation. You know, you can prove it, you don't reveal anything, and it is honest. And with, you know, cryptography and math, you can verify that it's true, one plus one is two, period, right? You know, um, and when it is a cryptographic hash, hash, pardon me, the computer can verify that hash and he knows that it is true. I don't need to know how he does that, right? Again, the process of writing the software is a bit more sophisticated, relatively, can be relatively difficult because you know, there are a lot of low level things happening. But it's the ability to prove that you know something without telling anybody what you know, but they can verify that you know what you know, right? It's really like, if you know, you know, and if you don't know well, you know, you move on. That's kind of like the, the gist of it. And we went over the Where's Waldo example, right? Which is like, you know something, you prove it to the person without telling them the details, and they can verify that you know it. Because they have to know that Waldo exists on that piece of paper to know that what you are saying is true, right? So from the Where's Waldo example, we're using more, um, less abstract things. There are things that they can point to. But in hardcore cryptography, the person has no detail necessarily. They just verify the cryptographic hash that has been generated, right? Again, this was, I, you know, I wanted to keep this as simply, simple as possible so we don't get overwhelmed. And lastly, well, we went over the importance as well, privacy and scaling Ethereum. I use Ethereum here. I, I recently saw a video of um, people using, trying to use um, zero knowledge proofs on, on Bitcoin which should be interesting, but I don't know any, you know, I haven't done any research. I don't know what the details are. So I'm just using Ethereum. It's not limited to Ethereum. It goes, cuts across, it's, it's a cryptographic um, um, term, protocol, if you will, and it works 
across the board, as long as like there's cryptography and cryptocurrencies, it's able to solve and math, it's able to solve that problem. And um, we looked into ZK EVMs and you know, I made a resource available where you can learn more about that. And we looked into ZK rollups as well. And thank you very much. So that is it. Um, we just went over. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, that was um, a quick primer into zero knowledge proof. I encourage you to, you know, spend a bit more time learning about it because it will scroll. You know, they're solving things in the zk space, and um, yeah, you know, I've looked into the tech. It's really cool, and and I encourage you to look into zero knowledge proof in general. It's just a really interesting concept. Thank you very much for your time. All right, questions. I think can I take questions? I think I can take questions. Yes. Can we have a microphone, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. I want to be sure I understood what you said about mm -hmm. how ZK rollups feed up the Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the normal Ethereum, let's say it's about a certain amount of transaction. Because that's to what I want to verify, it's a normal of information. But the ZK rollup added to it mm -hmm. will make that transaction more, to perform more transaction because. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. That's a great question. So I'll go over that one more time um, and quickly. So the Ethereum, Ethereum as it stands, you know, it's again the seventy-five-year-old man, right? So Ethereum is a seventy-five-year-old man in that example that I gave earlier, and the zk rollup is a young person like myself. So the transactions are not being handled by the 75-year-old man. So uh, Ethereum isn't handling the computer. It's not, you are not, for example, trading tokens on Ethereum in and of itself. So again, let's just paint the scenario. You have a question at some point? Okay, let's paint the scenario. So everyone here needs to execute a transaction. There is a 75-year-old man and there is a young person. Now, I'm not saying you cannot speak to the 75-year-old man. You can. However, it will take longer between when he's counting the money, he's thinking about what you want to do, right? But if you are speaking with a younger person, they're able to do that faster. And so they handle all of that computation. But to move to the next step of, let's say, issuing you what you need or to, or to adding it to the block, let's say there's a register, yes. And without that register, there's going to be a lot of problem. Without a register being properly populated, there'll be a few problems. So what that looks like is, and the only person that can fill anything in that register is a 75-year-old man. That is Ethereum, right? So what's happening is, this young person is executing those transactions. He needs to return proof data to the 75-year-old man so he can then populate, he can add it to the new block, which is a register in this case, right? The register is like maybe a list of things people are buying and stuff. It needs to happen. There, there's, you, you can't negotiate that. So what a ZK rollup is doing is it is helping the, you know, um, the 75-year-old man speed up populating the register. Because the faster he's able to populate the register, the faster he can handle more transactions, right? Because while this person has handled, let's say, 75 transactions, and he has sent the proof of 75 transactions to that man, while the 75-year-old man is populating that transaction on the register, that guy is handling another 75, and he's sending those at the same time. So this 75-year-old man can only handle five transactions proof per second, right? Or let's say five transactions per second, which means um, what that looks like is the people coming in here, he can only attend to them five people at the same time or per second. But when the zero knowledge proof guy is here, he's able to handle 75 of those. So which means by the time he sends five transaction proof, that is 75 times five transactions that he has sent to him, to the, you know, the, the 75 year old man. And the guy populates that and adds it to the block and we can move on. So the transactions are not happening on the 75 year old man mental capacity, right? They're happening on the ZK rollup. And then he's only sending like, yo, by the way, this happened. You want to like populate that, and that's what he does, right? Yeah. So I think you had a question. Okay. Right. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I 
so I think I have uh, two things to do. Okay. So I understand the CPO. Okay. So over one week, I can buy it. Yes. Yes. So what is the CPO? Is it the CPO? How? Right. Good question. Um, I, you know, I, I spent, I, I was really brief on that. So the ZK EVM, think of the ZK EVM as a, a theorem, Ethereum Pro Max, if you will, for lack of a better word. It is a blockchain, because it's, it's a virtual machine, if you will, right? That has zero knowledge, proof scalability, and privacy built on top of it, right? So um, Scroll is not a ZK EVM. I think it's a roll-up. Tyco is a ZK EVM. Okay, yeah, it's easy. So there are two brothers. One is 75 year old, the other one is 75 year old. However, this other 75 year old guy has, is from the future, right? He's done some genetic mutations and he's much smarter, faster. They bear perhaps the same name, but because he's from the future, you know, he has the advantage of long life, good health and all of that. So the similarities, which is where like type one ZK EVMs come in, the similarities between their twins, they're identical twins, right? But this guy is Ethereum. He's old, you know, he's not as you know, fast and nimble as he used to be. And this other guy is Ethereum Pro Max, right, from the future. But this guy has the benefits and advantage of being um, fast, quick, smart, and that is the ZK in the EVM, right? So 75-year-old man, Ethereum, you can think of the Pro Max as the ZK, right? The same way we can hypothetically just assume that a Pro Max iPhone is faster than a normal iPhone in the same generation, which isn't true, but for the sake of this, you know, concept, we're just going to work with that. So um, that is kind of like what it is. A ZK EVM is, a ZK EVM is its own blockchain independent of Ethereum, completely independent of Ethereum. However, because of the fact that Ethereum is popular, we need to build, we need to, the types of ZK EVM ensures that when you build a type one ZK EVM, Developers who have built stuff on Ethereum do not need to learn a new language. They do not need to learn a new piece of software. They do not, do not need to learn a new tooling to use your EVM. Because that's already difficult. Like, look, guys are already overwhelmed trying to solve the financial problem. You don't have to tell them to now learn a new language and build stuff on top of it, right? There, there's an interesting company called Fluent who's trying to solve a problem where you can write a single language for any... Um, any chain, right? So we have, let's say, Rust for Solana. We have Solidity for Ethereum. You could write perhaps Rust for all of the chains and it is going to work, right? That is ideal. But for ZK EVMs, type 1 ZK EVMs, right? so if you write Solidity and you port it to a ZK EVM, it's going to work 100%. And I know this because I've tested this. I've looked, you know, I had like smart contracts that were written and deployed on the Ethereum um, virtual machine, the Ethereum blockchain. And I took those and I deployed them into a testnet of um, Tyco in this case, and it worked fine. Otherwise, it would break. And I used the exact same tools that already exist, like where you write um, smart contracts, compile them, and deploy them on the Ethereum blockchain. Same tools, same thing. Only things that were different were the um, RPC, the um, getting tokens on the account you're going to do all of that. But the process was the exact same. So is it KVM in the, um, exists independently of Ethereum. However, we need to factor in the fact that Ethereum is the guy. Like, Ethereum is him. So we need to build stuff that people who already have stuff on Ethereum can easily move to the ZK EVM. Um, and I think that is it for questions. Okay, we have one more. I think that'll be the last one we'll take. Thank you. Hello, yes. So the question I want to ask is, Transaction okay. So if I'm using a dollop in this case, mm -hmm. like, and I want to submit a transaction, the, the dollop uh, from what I saw will patch it, right? Mm. And then submit to Ethereum. Mm. So my question is in two forms. The first question is who has a dollop? Is it Ethereum that does it or the mm -hmm. dollop that does it? And the second one is when I submit a transaction using the dollop, does it go to the main pool of that dollop mm. to pass the transaction? Right. Does it Okay. Okay. Good question. The first one. I'll answer the first one. Ethereum is going to be the one to add it to the block, right? It has to be again. 
you know, these things can get really complex where people can build roll-up tooling where they have their own like block explorer and like their own, own chain where the transaction is going to exist there and then they're going to then take that and send it to Ethereum still. But from my experience and to just keep it as simply as I can, the roll-up handles the transaction, it sends the proof of that transaction to Ethereum and then Ethereum adds that to the Ethereum block. Right? The question about mempool is a good one. I don't think I've thought about that and I don't think I've come across materials on that. But I would assume, and perhaps it's not safe to assume, but I would assume that all of the transactions will happen inside of the mempool of the rollup. And then the proof of, that trans of those transactions and the verification of that will happen on Ethereum's mempool, right? which is going back and forth and like verifying everything. Once it verifies that this is 100% accurate, it then adds that transaction to the block. I, that is my hypothesis, and I will stand by that with like maybe 75%, but that's how it'll happen based off of what I think I know about that. And I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, I'll be happy for, to, for anyone to educate me. But um, that is my guess. Does that help? Do you have another one? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Well...